All right. Well, folks, why don't we start? We have a lot to discuss today, as usual. And we have two stories regarding the Perseverance rover. Um, for the top, and it's the top news story, and another one under flight and space. The, uh, the top news one, news one, we can say touchdown. Mars Perseverance rover safely lands on the red planet, beginning the most extensive Mars mission ever. So that's what we'll be talking about for our top story. For technology, apparently robots don't just help farmers' mental health, cows like them too. Under materials on graphene, apparently the graphene narrow origami creates the tiniest microchips yet, one one hundredth of the size. And again, for our second story on Mars in flight, the Mars rover made a very precise landing. And people have described landing there as seven minutes of terror because half of landings fail. There had to be seven stages to be successful, each one for the landing to succeed. Wow. And now onto environment and climate change we have an unstable polar vortex. The climate change is not just warming, it causes the freeze in Texas. On biology, interesting. People, psychologists have done a lot of work about personality. And what they now find is the dolphins have a similar personality traits to us, the study finds. We're not all that unique. And in terms of humans and us, a problem. Maybe white America is facing the prospect of irrelevance and erosion and erasure. Uh, apparently, white America is the only group of people uh, that has had an increasing death rate for the last. 20 years. In health, there's a drug, we call it a game changer drug that treats obesity and it cuts body weight by 20%. So Richard, that's a lot of stuff to talk about today. And now what about uh, this top story? Tell us about it, about the rover landing, the Perseverance rover landing safely and beginning the most extensive Mars mission ever. Uh, we'll get into the details in a second. Uh, first, I want to show you a short video. You might have seen it, uh, but this will set the stage. We are starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver in preparation for parachute deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Sky team maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from the MRL. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance yeah. yeah. safely yeah. on the surface of Mars. Ready to begin seeking the sands of half life. Yeah. Looks like we're getting the first image. Hey, I feel close to the proximity of Samantha. This is the most amazing thing. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country. So uh, this was uh, a NASA event. And one of the things that NASA has been very good at is uh, getting us uh, video on that <coughs> tonight's TV. And they've done that since the first moonshot. And uh, 
that was, of course, a NASA video. And some of the scenes had to be uh, simulations because I don't think they had a vehicle with a camera there watching the uh, parachute come out. And I personally was amazed by how they got the lander on the planet that there was this other vehicle above it with jets and the lander was put down on cables. And it turns out that had to be done because the area that they were landing on on Mars was not some smooth area at their target area had rock beds and cliffs and all kinds of uh, obstacles and so they took special precautions. Anyway, we'll talk about that in the second story. This story though, uh, this was NASA's fifth rover on Mars and I didn't realize there had been so many but fifth, and so uh, there was uh, a 203 day journey that traveled almost 300 million miles. And uh, this mission is just packed with technology. I'll talk about those details as we go along, uh, but this mission is also seen as the first step in an effort to collect samples from Mars and send them back to Earth uh, for analysis. And uh, the rover that they landed there is about the size of a car. It's 2,263 pounds, so it's a pretty big load. And uh, it's a robot geologist and astrobiologist as well. And uh, we're not going to hear any news for several weeks because first they're going to go through a bunch of tests to make sure everything works right. And then uh, where they landed was a uh, crater area the Jezero crater and this particular area is uh, the geological formations are three and a half billion years old and the crater is from the time when uh, Mars had running water and part of its appeal is there is a river delta in this crater. And so they think it'll be a great place to look for life. And it had a power system called the multi-mission radio something or other thermoelectric generator that was designed by the DOE. And then it has all kinds of instruments and they gave them all uh, cute names. Uh, there are, uh, is a mass cam two, which is a pair of uh, zoomable cameras uh, that can take high res color 2D panoramic pictures. Uh, there's also a super cam, which is a pulsed laser, which is to study the material in the rocks. There is a uh, pixie or a pixel, which is a scanning uh, X-ray laboratory. There is another set of instruments that they call Sherlock, which will be collecting data on the Mars geology. And it together with Pixel will tell them a lot about the rocks and the chemical elements. Uh, they have an ultralight an ultraviolet scanner and a spectrometer on this thing. Uh, there is a Another tool, a uh, Watson imager, which will study the rock surfaces up close. There is a 
rim fax, which is a uh, ground penetrating radar. So we will be able to look under the ground and see if there are channels for water to be there. And then there is a, an experiment called the MOXIE, which is going to experiment to see if they can extract breathable ox oxygen out of the thin Mars atmosphere. That will be useful later. And uh, then they have a, another tool called MEDA, which is uh, like a Mars weather station. And then, of course, they have the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And so it's a bunch of science that is packed into this mission. And we're going to be hearing reports from this for the next two years. So any comments? Yes, the nice thing about it is that it's also been an international collaboration. Italy, Norway, and Denmark, and I believe also Australia, they helped develop some of the equipment there. Uh, and that is great because if the whole world, most of the world can get together, it's much more feasible. Yes, that's wonderful. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, the, well, thing, it, it, the thing I was going to mention is it has a little plutonium reactor, nuclear reactor that's power, the power source for the entire uh, mission. And apparently the older rovers had solar panels and the sun's rays are not good enough in, on Mars to power it long term. So they put a plutonium reactor that will, will power it, produce enough electricity for so that. So that, that must be this, what they call the multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. <laughs> right. And of course it has an acronym, that's the MMRTC. Yeah. <laughs> They've been using those thermoelectric generators in the oil industry here for probably at least 30 years. It's okay. like a thermocouple, only thousands of thermocouples, and then the heat from the uh, okay. burner or whatever generates electricity in the thermocouples. Okay. So it really is well-proven technology. Well, I suppose the uh, radioactive source would be the uh, novel part of the one on Mars. Uh -huh. Well, I think but you want to make it pretty compact. Yeah. and light and they don't have anything to burn there otherwise so they got to get the heat from somewhere okay okay but the interesting thing too is mars's atmosphere they say is mostly carbon dioxide yet it's pretty cold on mars so you'd think that carbon dioxide would be causing global warming in a greenhouse effect, <laughs> but apparently if not more, if there were more yeah. of it <laughs> You, you know, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is the helicopter itself. The atmosphere on Mars is 1% of the thickness or the density of the, the Earth's atmosphere. So yes. designing a helicopter with enough lift to be able to function, even function, is a pretty remarkable technical achievement. Yes, okay. I, ag I agree. I've wondered how they did it with a helicopter myself. Yeah. Of course, it's not proven yet. They're going to be launching it in a couple of weeks. But uh -huh. uh, it's pretty remarkable. Yes. They probably got the batteries from China for it. <laughs> well, moving along from um, COVID and brain health to robots and mental health. <clears throat> Apparently, it's good for farmers' mental health, but it's also good for cows. What's that about? Well, uh, this is interesting to me uh, for... Uh, uh, another reason, and that is that, uh, you know, you hear that technology often has unexpected consequences, and it turns out not all of them are bad, as this story illustrates. Uh, and the story starts off talking about uh, Mickey... Eilard, who's apparently a Canadian farmer who uh, would regularly wake up in the dead of night to milk a hundred cows. And now he has a robot 
that does the job. And he says, we used to get up at three in the morning to milk cows. Now we're not starting until 5.30 or 6. And just getting that extra bit of sleep is <clears throat> huge on the family's mental health. Mm -hmm. And it turns out uh, farmers are not the only ones that benefit from this technology. It looks like the cows prefer it too. <laughs> and more than half of Canadian farmers suffer from anxiety. Over a third are depressed. Deaths by suicide are also higher among farmers than uh, other workers in the general population. And uh, a study found that 74% of farmers were affected with opioid addiction, dairy farmers with opioid addiction, which is almost twice the rate of the general rural population. So these are guys that are under great stress and the brutal schedule uh, plays a undeniable role in this. And these automatic milking and feeding stations uh, can provide farmers with more time flexibility and more sleep. And these systems are pretty cool. A cow can just walk in to a milking stall and the milking stall gives them an individualized ration of food. I don't know if it's taking their weight or doing a facial identification on a cow to know which cow it was or what but they individualize the food while the machine locates her udders and milks her. And this gives the cows a lot more freedom and flexibility, it turns out, and the cows like it better. Now, it's hard to do uh, kind of stress tests on cows. The psychologists haven't figured that out out how to do that. But what they did for this study is to measure their well-being is they looked at uh, lameness in the cows. And what they found was interesting. It turns out to start with that uh, farmers who have better mental health had fewer lame cows in their herd. So uh, you have to, it takes mental energy to be able to take care of the cows. And uh, they uh, don't really know if the benefits are uh, to the cows or to the farmers because uh, it could actually work both ways and they could contribute to each other. Uh, the farmer is going to be have better mental health because they're able to sleep better and to better take care of their animals. The animals, though, if they're doing well from a health and standpoint, then it turns out the farmers are happier, too. So the cow's health and the farmer's health contribute to each other. And all it takes is your automatic milking, feeding cow robot. Any comments? Well, I was the way uh, I was wondering how they know whether the, that the cows are happy. Is it just that they're in better health? Uh, they were uh, used, in this case, the uh, stress test on the cows and the cows that, and so, as I say, they don't have yet uh, psychological testing on cows. And so they had to use another technique. Well, and the cows yes, voluntarily yes, like on cows. Sorry, sorry, Andrew. Oh, the, what, the cows. What would the stress test for cows be like? 
I think too they can tell if they're not lame. But uh, the yeah. cows, the cows actually uh, uh, line up to uh, take advantage of these automatic milking stalls, and oh. the cow has a tag. So when she moves into the milking stall, it identifies oh, her. Okay, that's how they do it. And uh, then uh, okay. Okay. it'll give her the ration that's prescribed for her condition, but it also measures the amount of milk that she produces at the, each okay. interval. So all that's kept, they keep track of all that, and then they're able to uh, cull the herd uh, to retain the cows that are performing better and uh, and otherwise optimize the uh, operation of the dairy farm. Mm -hmm. okay. I so believe all... that the quality of the milk also is shown. Uh, cows that are anxious, they worried they don't give the same quality of milk. So you mm. can measure it also in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, d different breeds give different amounts of butterfat in the milk. Like Jersey cows give less milk, but higher butterfat content. Holstein cows give uh, larger quantities of uh, milk, but lower butterfat. I didn't realize that you were such a cow spurt expert. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> You're a multi-talented guy. Well, well I, my, my family has been in the dairy business for 120 years, okay. 110 years. So. Are they uh, using this equipment? Uh, no, because they got out of it before this was available. They used to milk all their cows by hand. Okay. You know, they, they didn't even have compressed air. Wow. Now, one of the benefits they say about this technology is farm help is hard to find. And uh, the kind of hours that they work would be one big reason for this. And telling uh, the guy that he could sleep at night would help uh, attract him to the job. I'm sure that's it. I have a cousin who's uh, their family farmed, uh, had a big dairy in uh, Ontario and had over a hundred cows. And so they would have one holiday a year for a couple of days. And what they do is trade with a neighbor who, and they would take care of his cows and right. he would take care of their cows. And that was about it. But otherwise it's a 24 seven job. Wow. It's, uh, every day of the year. Yeah. Yes. Okay, on to materials. What uh, we've talked about a lot is microchips. And apparently now we've got the tiniest microchips yet, one one hundredth the size. And you can guess it, the way we're doing it is through using graphene and nano origami. Richard, tell us about it. Now, of course, as a X chip guy, then you all know that one of my interests is in this technology and the chips and uh, what we're going to do now that we've run into the limits of Moore's law where everything can continually get smaller and cheaper and more powerful. And uh, I've been talking for months about this kind of 2D semiconductor technology that will be the next generation. Uh, what we're hearing here actually is a competitive uh, approach. A few weeks ago, I talked about people who are uh, using a new kind of uh, 2D transistor that they implant onto the surface of the uh, nanomaterial and but this is uh, a different approach it turns out by creating kinks bends in the structure of graphene you can make mm -hmm. graphene behave like a transistor that means you can get it to 
work like these circuits do in conventional microchips. And what they're doing is mechanically creating kinks in a layer of graphene. A, and they say a bit like origami. So this is how the origami got in there. And they say this kind of technology, which they now call strain tronics, which is one of the several different kind of new tronics is that uh, they're de working on that uses nanomaterials as opposed to electronics allows for more chips inside a device and they can do everything that we want to do to computers to speed them up and they can do it just by crinkling graphene like they did here. And so instead of having to add foreign objects into a device like these other guys did, they've shown that they can create structures from graphene that will do this same work like a transistor or a logic gate. And again, their first example was something that was a uh, hundred times smaller than it would have been if you'd have made it out of the conventional semiconductor materials. So I would say this looks remarkably promising. We just have to have people with tiny fingers to crinkle all the graphene. <laughs> Any comments? And boggling. And again, as usual, these are the comments that we get to these uh, material stories because these material stories really are on the edge of people's knowledge. So it's hard to comment about something you're still trying to figure out yourself. Richard, going back to the late 80s, I was working on clock systems. Uh -huh. uh, that was the time when the edge from one logic device to the other began behaving like a, a transmission line. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't any longer just put, put the edge and all the logic devices. And I remember there were some logic devices that had a, a transmission time of 100 or 200 picoseconds, not nanoseconds. Yes, yes. So even at that time, things were getting to be pretty fast. Yes, and now uh, they're talking about, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of orders of magnitude faster. Right. <laughs> so somebody said, if you want to picture a nanosecond, picture the time it takes a sine wave to go through one foot of coaxial cable. <laughs> Now, most non-engineers won't understand that. Sorry. <laughs> it's OK. It's OK. So if we don't understand that, maybe we have to have more understanding by going back to Mars. And what do you want to talk about now about this precise landing of Mars rover? Now, uh, it's an amazing job, I think, that uh, they got to the, they got down and did this. And, you know, again, a big part of it is this Jezero crater uh, is not a smooth surface. It has steep cliffs, sand dunes, boulder fields, and, uh, landing on Mars is difficult. Uh, half of the time, we haven't made it. And uh, the uh, before the thing lands, then we just have we just have to complete these maneuvers correctly. The first is cruise stage separation, where the vehicle separates from uh, the rocket that got it to Mars. Then we have atmospheric 
entry, so we have to get into the thin atmosphere. And even though it's thin, there's still a time of heating. And one of the milestones is peak heating there of that got to about 1300 degrees Celsius. So it's not cool. Then parachute deployment. We saw a simulation of that in the video. Then heat shield separation. And then back shell separation where uh, the back half of the entry capsule is separated and the thing will uh, do the touchdown we saw. And then there is touchdown using their new sky crane maneuver. And then you have to get it into a spot where it's flat enough to land and nothing is uh, predictable so far when they're doing this because, you know, we haven't done this very much. And so uh, the Perseverance itself, though it had uh, pre-programmed landing routines, it also has sufficient autonomy so that as it's coming down, for example, if there's a boulder in the way, it can adjust its position to go around the boulder and land safely. And as we know, it did. Hooray, NASA. <laughs> Yes. Any comments? Well, you know, I think one of the remarkable things, too, is that it's 300. We lost you, VJ. We lost your sound. We've still lost you. No, I was saying that it's 300 million mi plus miles away. And uh, even at the speed of light, a signal from Earth takes eight or nine minutes to get to get to the, the rover. That's why it had to have autonomy. Yeah, so it's pretty remarkable that, you know, you don't even know whether you succeeded or not for eight minutes. <laughs> That's right. And the critical period is seven minutes long. That's right. <laughs> now, also, another associated thing that I didn't talk about is last year, they did an upgrade on the Mars orbiter that is there to upgrade the communications relay from uh, Mars to Earth. So it would be more reliable and faster. So as a part of this mission that didn't get any publicity was an upgrade of the orbiting radio station on Mars. And if that doesn't make you grin, I don't know what will. <laughs> And you know, one of the reasons they picked this Jericho crater is that it's uh, also a dried up riverbed and they're hoping to find the signs of water and life. Yes. And that that's why they picked such a difficult location. That's pretty remarkable. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm up in Albany, New York, and our, our uh, we, we're part of, um, we have close by Rensselaer Polytech Institute. And they have right. been working on well, I remember years ago they were working on the rover for Mars, and and it was and they had a watch party, so I was sort of watching with them, and I don't mind telling you it was so exciting for them. And you know every single every single um, different level that you just went through, you know all of a sudden, yes. eh, you know the parachute it opened, you know. <laughs> That's and <they're> right. like, <laughs> <clears throat> okay, it's loose. Okay, it's okay. And here, and, and telling how how fast it was, it was great. It was great. It was a great, great experience. So, and these young kids, oh my God, you know they're going to be brilliant. You know, and uh, well, they are brilliant because they're there. So it was fun. It was a great experience. It's wonderful that you got to experience that directly. Mm hmm. Yeah, they also talked, and I haven't seen anything. It seems as though they have a helicopter. Yes, so uh, I didn't talk. Like I talked briefly about it. Yes, or a, or a drone. A helicopter so, that is a drone. Okay, but also it seems as though they had cameras at the bottom so that they could look around and see yes. where they could land. Of course, you know. So yeah, so 
We haven't seen any pictures from the helicopter yet, have we? Not yet. The, the helicopter is still uh, weeks away from taking off. They yeah. have to do a bunch of ground testing first. Yeah, it's actually in the belly of the rover and uh, the, just launching the helicopter from the belly, they open a flap and then the helicopter is lowered onto the ground and it's a pretty elaborate procedure. It's pretty <laughs> mind-boggling. Yeah, exciting. And it's uh, there's a good movie about Mars called The Martian with Matt Damon. And uh -huh. uh, it's worth uh, watching on Netflix or whatever if you see it. And th the book was uh, very good too by a guy named Andy Weir with quite a bit of the science involved in uh, dealing with Mars. But uh, the idea that we might ever colonize Mars is a pretty remote idea because of the, uh, it doesn't have the magnetic field that the earth does to protect life from uh, cosmic radiation. So right. uh, they'd have to uh, have all manner of additional protective uh, gear to uh, deal with this cosmic radiation hazard. Well, moving on from that kind of a hazard to the hazard in Texas the freeze in Texas. And apparently we have an unstable polar vortex caused by climate change and that's doing it all. Richard, what's this all about? Well, uh, just to make sure people are properly confused, the real sign of the that came before the cold wave in Texas about a month before there was record breaking heat in the Arctic and the it got to 100 degrees F. And wow. uh, the way that the hot Arctic uh, caused this heat uh, problem in Texas is that uh, as the uh, higher latitudes get warmer, they reduce the temperature variation between mid-latitude and polar latitudes. And this in turn destabilizes the polar jet stream where it starts to dip into lower latitudes like Texas. And uh, so the cold in Texas was the direct result of the heat in the Arctic. And uh, this is an example that climate change, or as you might call it, the climate catastrophe or the climate chaos, uh, it's not going to be a smooth and gradual warming like turning up the thermostat in your home, but it's going to be punctuated with these kind of events, which is why some people call it the climate chaos. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Yeah, there is a uh, theory that uh, ice ages are triggered by global warming and mm -hmm. uh, downdrafts of cold air. And when they find these mammoths in melting glaciers, they inevitably have green grass and green forage in their stomachs. Uh, and the theory mm -hmm. is that uh, the mammoth was flash frozen by a downburst of this super cold okay. air that okay. is caused by global warming. That makes sense. That's a better explanation than I had heard. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments? Well, the one thing I had read about the polar vortex some months ago, and what it is is like it's like a rubber band of jet streams around uh, northern latitudes. Yes. That keeps all the cold over the Arctic. And, and over Canada and Norway and stuff. And what's happening is because of the climate change thing, it's like stretching, it's like a rubber band that's keeping everything intact. In and now it's like stretching that rubber band down to different geographic regions. 
I thought that was a very good uh, description of what the polar vortex is. <laughs> Moving along to biology. What's this about dolphins being the same as us with the same personality traits? Now, I, this is, uh, I think, fascinating uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one of which is that uh, the dolphins are really the first non-primate that they have done any of this kind of study with. And before they did the study, they had the theory that uh, dolphins with their intelligence would show a special, some personality traits, particularly curiosity and sociability. And uh, what the study showed was that dolphins, like primates, are intelligent and uh, they have brains that are larger than are needed for their body. So the excess brain matter gives them uh, the ability to be intelligent. And they think intelligent species are often more curious. So uh, this study confirmed what they thought. They studied with this uh, 134 male and female bottlenose dolphins and uh, gave them a personality evaluation by the staff. Again, they don't have the personality test that they can have a dolphin do and poke their nose and give the score. So they had to be rated by human beings. And what they ended up finding is there is a uh, generally accepted model of human personality that has five traits and people's personalities are a mix of these traits, the same as with dolphins. And these traits are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Not all of the traits are positive traits. And uh, they found, again, in this five-point uh, matrix, you could describe dolphins' personalities very well, just like you can describe human personalities very well. And the scientists still don't have any idea why behavior comes down to these five traits. And one reason they're doing these studies on animals is so, of course, they can understand humans better by seeing what we have in common and why. And uh, they, so dolphins share personality traits with humans, but the head of the study said, quote, I don't want people to misinterpret that and say humans and dolphins have the same personality traits. They don't. They just uh, share uh, some that are similar. And so uh, can a dolphin be your friend? I guess if they're <laughs> amiable enough, why not? <laughs> Any questions? Uh, well, one problem the dolphins have is the adolescent male dolphins become, they travel in packs and become a real nuisance to the rest of the dolphins. So the adults have to uh, deal with these adolescent males that are nothing but trouble. Okay, the <laughs> dolphin <laughs> gangs. Yeah. Yeah, juvenile delinquents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's worth you know, interesting. Anybody, Go ahead, anybody, sorry. Yeah. Anybody who's had a dog, you know, realizes that dogs have personalities and, th you know, uh, I don't find it so surprising that dolphins have uh, 
more personality than dogs, you know. But uh, yeah, you know, you get you get uh, you get uh, you know all kinds of traits with, with dogs, you know. But again, the thing that is interesting is not that dolphins have personality, but that their personalities share the same kind of traits as humans do. Yeah. Well, it's the same with dogs, isn't it? You know, you get you get brave dogs and timid dogs. Uh huh. And uh, you know, and greedy dogs and exuberant <laughs> dogs. Yes. Yeah. Now I've heard that uh, another <laughs> animal that has a large brain for body mass are octopuses. Octopi. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if anybody has done any personality tests on octopi yet. And they may be done a bit on crows. Richard is starting screen, screen I see. sharing. And uh, it looks like uh, something is going wrong with my computer. So I am stopping screen sharing and trying to figure out what's wrong. And I'm clicking my mouse again to see if it works better. OK. OK. This is a story. There is a. Uh, friend of ours here in a HEIC, Pete, who talks about uh, part of this. And uh, he says that, uh, you know, the 75 million people who voted for Trump are not going away just because there is a uh, new government. And this uh, story is from an interview with a white expat American who has lived abroad for more than 40 years. So he has this perspective that you get and many of us have of America that comes from living outside. And he says that uh, if there are in the white Americans, then there is, are these uh, people who uh, feel like victims and then victimize themselves. They create environments in which they view themselves as doomed to failure, that the system is rigged against them and then it spirals down into uh, many other problems. And they have to have someone besides themselves to blame. And so the government is an easy target. So are these people who are competing for the jobs that they no longer have. And uh, Within this group, one of the things that is interesting is uh, the their death rate. The death rate for white American non-Hispanics has been going up for the last 20 years. That's the only group in America that that's true of. And he says that uh, this is the end result of marginalization isolation, fear of irrelevance, and victimhood. And the end result is death by despair. And uh, mortality rights, rates do not rise unless the under, there's something going on in the society. And here, there has been then this long-term uh, 
loss of jobs, loss of position, loss of status, as that has been driven by the kind of outsourcing that has gone on in America for the last 50 years. Uh, and because of this kind of despair, this despair really ends up, uh, you can categorize it with four different categories that uh, one, where one leads to another. The first is marginalized, marginalized. The second is isolated. The third is the feeling of being irrelevant. And then this leads to the feeling of being a victim. And uh, this feeling of being a victim is something that uh, despots have used and still use around the world. And the strategy to get them riled up and focused and working on your set of ideas was a strategy that was used uh, by Hitler. It's also the strategy that is used by Al Qaeda and ISIS. And so they're still appealing to these uh, same kinds of groups. And when you have the, uh, what we have had for the, we have shrunk the size of the pie as we have outsourced the jobs and where made in America is now very scarce and it used to be a sign of pride, then it makes it ripe for some politician who comes up and says, make America great again. And mm -hmm. so uh, I think this kind of despair and uh, sense of isolation and hopelessness and victimhood certainly is at the heart of a lot of things that we have seen on the right politically. And as I say, uh, what to do. The 75 million people are not just going to go away or lay down and be nice. What to do. Any comments? Yes, I think I have lived roughly half my life outside the United States. Uh, and I think when we're talking about uh, despaired white, I believe they're mostly the less educated white. Uh, that have lost their job because of outsourcing, but also automation. And that's going to continue as they're being replaced by machines and other things. Um, so I, I don't know what the solution is, but um, I as I said, I think it's the less educated part of the whites that have the biggest problems. There are also people who uh, are in areas that are impacted by the change and somehow they feel like they shouldn't have to move. You know, they're Americans. We shouldn't have to move somewhere else. And that is one of the things that contribute to their problems. I think there's some, I think there's some truth to it. I'm trying, because I lived the first half of my life in England, and it was always the younger people who were radical and kind of uh, not accepting the status quo and feeling victimized. Uh, but, you know, I don't know whether the, England, uh, you, you know, or Britain has become the same as the United States now. I think probably not so it is it's probably some truth to the fact that it is a an american phenomena it is really amazing in the united states because this is truly the melting pot um, i got my citizenship two years ago and at the ceremony there were 74 people from 30 some different nations you know africa from Asia, from every part. And this has been going on months after months after months. So immigrants are coming in. 
Mm. Yeah, change that. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm also an immigrant. I'm not European or European heritage, but I'll give you some observations that I have seen. I've been in America, North America for almost 50 years, 48 years. Mm -hmm. And when I first came here in the early 70s, <clears throat> I used to see if people lost, if a coal miner lost his job in, in West Virginia, he would rent a U-Haul and go to California or Florida or something and start a new life, get trained go into a different part of the economy like the service sector or the technology mm -hmm. sector or things like that. In fact, the the, cap, the the chairman of Apple Computer is from Alabama. He's from a small town in Alabama and he was gay and he was victimized like crazy in Alabama and he moved to California and joined Apple and ended up becoming its president and chairman. So uh, people were very mobile and they would go where the opportunity was and they were willing to retrain themselves I'm finding a less and less of that today. You know, people are very rooted. If they lost a job in the coal mine, they want to continue to work uh, and live with family and work in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. That to me is a little alarming because in the 70s, that wasn't the case at all. I saw, I used, I drove from, I used to, I went to graduate school in Texas and I drove across the country and I used to see hundreds and hundreds of U-Hauls on the highway. And they were all yes. transplanted Americans moving to other parts of the op opportunity environment. But yes. that's gone. That resilience is gone today. That's very, very troubling. And when I was uh, working at National Semiconductor through the 70s, one of the things I would see is these groups of people who had moved to California from different places, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, and things like this. And there would be groups of friends that would move kind of at the same time and give each other support in the new place. You know, a good example, for example, is the Mars mission. The, the, the lead person for the entire control system was a young Indian <laughs> woman, woman engineer. Yes. And she has two, uh, master's and PhDs in ast uh, astronomical engineering and aeronautical engineering from MIT. And she was she rose to the top of that group in, uh, in NASA for the Mars mission. And she was born in India and she came to this country when she was one year old. Now, somebody from Kentucky who worked in the tobacco industry would not consider doing that. That's the problem. I have no problem with competition and the best should rise to the top, but there just isn't that resilience anymore. I don't know what something is, something is going wrong with society, you know? Now, another thing that uh, I don't often hear in these analyses is America after World War II was really in a unique position in the world. Uh, on one hand, the technological changes were starting to happen. And uh, in America, uh, because of the GI Bill, we had the biggest group of college graduates ever. And also, as uh, the Industrial Revolution was really moving towards the electronics revolution, America has all of these natural resources that other places don't have. And America still had the advantage over Europe, which is to make a new place. You just go into some of this vacant land. You don't have to tear down what was there before. And with these things combining, then there was this enormous period of prosperity that lasted certainly through the 60s, so 30 years through that. And in this period of prosperity, then uh, America had the lion's share of the world's wealth with a small percentage of the population. And what has happened since then is other countries have developed technologies and infrastructure and production capability. And so instead of America having the biggest piece of pie, uh, a lot more people have pieces of pie. And that means the American piece of the pie is smaller. And what these guys feel is my piece of the pie is smaller than my father's. What's wrong here? Right. I think England went through the same thing. I mean, and you know, with England, it was very uh, conspicuous because there was a loss of empire. Uh, yes. I mean, 
Yeah, and when I was a kid, all the older people were bemoaning the uh, loss of empire and the way that things used to be and hankering back to the time when there was supremacy and things like that. Probably by now, Britain has got through it and America is only halfway through it. <laughs> I'm not sure they got through it because Brexit. Why did Brexit happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, Rich, moving on to our last story, and I'm wondering if it has a link to the one we've just been talking about. Because some people say that obesity is uh, a cause of a lot of death. And now, do we have a drug that can treat obesity? Uh, and by doing that, might it have some impact on the fact of all of these white Americans dying off? Now, that's an interesting connection, Fred. And uh, it could be, uh, you're right. Now, to start with, this study, the reason for the study in the background was because of COVID and what they have uh, found with COVID, of course, is that people who are overweight or obese have a much worse time with the disease and the after effects of the disease. And so that, in fact, was uh, part of the thinking that the scientists had. So what they've done is they uh, have done a test that was more than a year long with what it turns out was an injectable drug that was already being used to treat diabetes. And they gave them a higher dosage and maintained it for more than a year. And what they found was the average weight loss for the uh, about a thousand people, I think, were in the study. I don't have that number in front of me. Anyway, in the study, this was a phase three study they've done, so it was very serious. And the average weight loss was 15%. And a third of the people had. Uh, a weight loss of uh, 20%. So it's very significant. They call it a game changer. The drug is semaglutinide and it works uh, basically by imitating uh, the body's own uh, system and imitating a hormone that your body puts out when it's had enough and you're satisfied. So they, this uh, drug gives you more, I'm satisfied with the food so I don't need to eat more. And as a result of that, people don't eat as much. And when they don't eat as much, their weight goes down. And so it's already a drug that uh, doctors know and have uh, experience with it. Uh, the, in the study, there were some participants that reported side effects, mainly mild to moderate nausea and diarrhea, which uh, were transient and went away after a while. So uh, it looks like uh, that this is a is a game changer for uh, weight loss, and it's a weekly injection that you can take. And as long as you're taking the injection, you don't get as hungry. <laughs> Any comments? Well, it sounds like a magic bullet, and I, <laughs> I don't uh -huh. really believe in those. <laughs> Well, I think too, a lot of us don't eat because we're hungry. We eat because it's some, we enjoy the eating or we enjoy the conversation. Yeah. So, right, uh, it's a social experience, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So maybe they got a drug for that too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I think they might be legalizing it in the US. Yeah. 
but I'm afraid last, that's not going to make people lose weight. In the last the 12 months, I've lost uh, 23 pounds, and that is going on to a more protein diet than, uh -huh. than carbohydrate. Sure. Uh, I'm, I, I, I lost all that by, say, last November, and since then I've really... I've not lost any more. I've probably gone back to eating carbs quite a bit. But it was fairly easy. I found that, um, you know, having big helpings of meat and fish was it satisfied me without taking a drug. <laughs> That's right. My uh, wife uh, used the Atkins diet for a while, and she loved it because she could eat all the bacon she wanted. Yeah. <laughs> So, Clyde, when you get back from Vancouver Island to Ahihi, you'll have to lay off the tacos and all the good stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Richard, thanks a lot. And thanks to everybody for participating. And we'll see you again next week. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Adios. 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 Thanks, Richard. See you next week. See you guys. Bye bye. Take care. Take care. That's right. Adiós.